Здравствуй, дорогая мамочка. Меня все время не покидает чувство вины перед тобой. Я не сказала, что ухожу на фронт. Прости меня. Я думаю, как тебе здесь должно быть трудно таскать такой пулемет. A Soviet film, The Song of Manshuk, directed by Majid Begalin, written by Andrei Kanchalovsky, and with magnificent Natalia Arambasarova playing the main character, saw the light on March 6, 1979. It portrays the heroic story of the first woman in the East to receive the title of the hero of the Soviet Union. The film became mega popular and was included in the treasury of the Soviet cinema. The image of Manshuk, so tender and fragile, but also brave and strong-willed, embodied the true daughter of the Great Steppe, who did not hesitate to sacrifice her life for the sake of her homeland and her people. However, in real life, Manchuk's heroic act was fueled by one more reason, which could not be mentioned in any way in a Soviet film. In fact, Manchuk went to the front and valiantly fought in order to defend the name of her father, Ahmed Mametov, who was declared an enemy of the people and shot dead in One autumn evening of 1938, a black car drove up to the house of the famous Almaty doctor Ahmed Mametov. Are you Ahmed Mametov? That's me. Pack your bags. You're under arrest. Why are you taking him? You have no right. What are the charges? He's charged as an enemy of the people. Ahmed Mametov was a well-known venerologist who worked for many years in various parts of Kazakhstan, fighting outbreaks of epidemics and saving hundreds of lives. He was convicted as an accomplice of the Allah Sharda and was shot almost immediately in 1938. His daughter, Manshuk, did not know anything about this and was sure that the arrest of her father was a tragic mistake that sooner or later justice would prevail and he would return home. So, when she heard that the children of convicts could aid their parents by going to the front, she decided to do so, without a moment's hesitation. The war, however, will not start for another three years, and until that moment, Manchuk will truly know the fate of those who have to bear this shameful stigma, the stigma of a family member of an enemy of the people. Ahmed Mametov was a member of the western wing of the Alash Orda. Zakian Seifulin wrote about Ahmed Mametov in the thorny path for the first time. The western wing was a strong one, it had a lot of well-educated and talented people. A lot of them graduated from universities, a lot of strong-minded people. Khalil Dosmuhamedov, Bahijan Karataev were also a part of it, as well as a state Duma member and a lawyer. Mametov was a very talented person. He was a poet who published a lot of poems in the iCup magazine and the Kazakh newspaper. He truly left his mark on this world. She walked the streets of Almaty thinking it would always be like this. A favorite city, a favorite playground, friends, school. Studying was easy for Manshuk. She was a quick learner. They came to Almaty from Oral, where her dad Ahmed worked as a chief physician in one of the Oral hospitals. 
He managed to stop a smallpox epidemic there. As a result, Ahmed Mamedov was appointed the first director of the Research Institute of Skin and Venereal Diseases. Munchuk was very proud of her dad. He was smart and kind and helped her in everything. Her father was also incredibly talented. He played the dombra, could sing and write poems. He wanted to study journalism like his friends did, but ended up choosing medicine. He loved his wife Amina very much. The beautiful and intelligent woman captured Ahmed's heart at first sight. But to get her attention, he had to work for it. Her father was against their marriage at first, but she was a Turiya. She came from a line of Kazakh Hans. She was one of their descendants, and we were ordinary Kazakhs. The Tori descendants did not like marrying their children to common folk. Five years later, Ahmed managed to make a name for himself and earn quite a lot of money. They were quite well off. They ordered furniture from the UK. Amina's father later treated Ahmed with respect, recognizing his status. He was a big man with a big heart. He gave them everything he could. Manchuk, you know, we too can be sent to the camps as the family of an enemy of the people. I know, so what? Manchuk, I have to tell you something. You are not our daughter. Manchuk's mother Amina told her that she was adopted. She and her husband took her in as a little baby because they could not have children of their own. According to Kazakh tradition, which allows adopting children of close relatives, Manchuk was taken from her father's cousin, who lived in a village. Her real name was Mansiya, but as a baby she could not pronounce it correctly and instead used to say Manchuk. And so everyone around began calling her Manchuk. Some relatives even called her Minin Monshavam, my little bead. Life became very difficult after collectivization. People had no more livestock or land. Manchuk's family could barely make ends meet, which is why the parents gave their daughter away in the hope that the Mameta family will provide her with a better life. Amina's words came as a blow for Manchuk. They already had a tense relationship, but now it seemed that she was beating Manchuk with this terrible truth, taking out on her all her pain for what had happened, for Ahmed, for her ruined life. Amina Mametova used to say that she broke down. I became a little irritated. I sometimes answered Manchuk not with the words a mother should have said. So she said to me that she believed that she was saving Manchuk by telling her the truth. She did not know that Manchuk would run away from home. Perhaps because she was not her birth mother. It seems Amina did not develop motherly instincts. Or maybe because she was just this kind of a person. She didn't try to make excuses for herself when talking to me. <laughs> Look at me. I can hardly hold back tears. When I heard this woman's story, I was thinking to myself, how could she have done such a thing? At that time, I was young, but I already had a four-year-old son, and I still couldn't believe. Although I gave birth to my own son, but I saw in her eyes that she was not a mother. She was a wife to her husband. Taking the girl in was just convenient. They could have a family. It was also because Ahmed loved Manchuk very much, and she loved him back. They shared a connection. Amina felt herself as a mentor, a teacher, and as a wife. She was bringing up some village girls who came to the house of aristocrats. Manchuk was told that all her childhood. Amina tried to instill in Manchuk some aristocratic behavior, but still could see the temperament. Sometimes Amina tried to punish Manchuk for not behaving when they still lived in Oral, but the girl would just run away from home. Строгая жена, я 
воспитывал эту девочку, девочку аульную, которая, придя в дом аристократов, где вот это все, я с детских лет ей все это внушала, воспитывала в ней это, видя в ней этот, в ее, в ее поступках смелость, решительность. Но порой я видел в ней, вот к тому примеру, когда она уходила из дома, еще живя в Уральске, когда я ее наказывала, она просто убегала из дома. Амина suggested that Manchuk take the last name of her birth parents, Aliyeva. I won't change my last name, ever. But Manchuk was adamant. For her, this was a betrayal of the person who raised her, brought her up, put his soul into her. So Manchuk, risking her freedom, because the families of the enemies of the people were exiled to the camps almost immediately, kept her last name as Mametova. This was the name that went down in history. The fate of the girl's birth parents was also tragic. Manchuk's father, Zhien Sigali, who worked as a security at a warehouse, was accused of stealing flour and convicted. And her mother, Toil Shah, died not long after him, either from poverty and disease or from shame. Before moving to Almaty, where Manchuk went to school number 28, which in those years bore the name of Joseph Stalin, Manchuk traveled with her parents across Kazakhstan. Being young professionals, Mametovs worked in Simei, Mangashlak and Oral, where they showed good results. However, the father wanted Manchuk to get an education in the capital. She quickly found friends among her classmates and became a straight-A student. She was diligent, careful and a quick learner. These walls still remember her loud laughter, remember the Kazakh songs she taught her classmates when she got into the class full of Russian-speaking students. Савина Софья Александровна рассказывает мне, her teacher, Safiya Sarina, told me that Ahmed brought young Mangshuk to her new school. But it was not an ordinary school, Sarina said, that the girl will have difficulty studying in her class because it was a class for Russian-speaking children. Mangshuk does know Russian, Sarina says, but I can see that she is not proficient. The school had two Kazakh-speaking classes, so the teacher advised Ahmed to take his daughter to one of them. There, she would have a better chance of becoming a good student. In Sarina's class, she would struggle. Ahmed took the teacher's advice, took Manchuk to the hall and told her that she will sign her up for a Kazakh-speaking class. Sarina remembers seeing stubborn Manchuk telling her father that she will study only in the Russian-speaking class. I don't want to go to a Kazakh-speaking class. I want to study in her class, said the girl. Someone has recommended the Mametovs to take Manchuk to Sarina. She was a teacher of the year at the time. She was well known, which is why Manchuk wanted to be her student. So, eventually, Manchuk ended up in Sarina's class. During recess, Sarina would go to teacher's lounge, just like the rest of the teachers. But she remembers being concerned for the girl. She was afraid that the girl would not make any friends. After all, she was different. She was not like big city children. When I asked Sarina what Manchuk was like, she described her as a very simple and timid girl that lacked any outstanding qualities, let alone bravery. Three days after Manchuk started school, Sarina was walking to her classroom at one point and heard a noise coming from there. She heard a sound of a Kazakh song coming out of the classroom. She was confused at first, but when she walked into the room, she saw Manchuk standing in the middle, helping the class sing the Kazakh song. Manchuk wrote the lyrics on the blackboard and was conducting the class as a choir. And the class consisted of many different nationalities. It was hard for them to sing in Kazakh, but Manchuk helped. И не поняла. Мой шумный класс, который очень отличается знанием, очень сильный класс, э, вдруг из класса слышу казахскую песню. 
Я сперва не поняла. Прихожу в класс, в центре класса стоит Маджук, а мой класс поет казахскую песню. Она на доске написала куплетами, припев. Детям были и казахи, и русские, разных национальностей. Давалось это трудно, но она дирижировала. And this bright, beautiful, and happy world collapsed after her father's arrest. The future was frightening and the present unbearable. Manchuk's adoptive mother, Amina, was waiting to be arrested any day now, while having to fend off harassers who believed that the wife of the enemy of the people had no honor. Amina used to tell me that it was very hard for her when Ahmed was taken away. And the next day, men started coming to her house, banging on her door until morning, demanding that she open the door. They were saying that she was the wife of the enemy of the people, she should get off her high horse. They wouldn't leave me alone, she said, so I had to get married. Amina said that no book could describe this hell. I asked her how did she manage to stay in the city, considering that wives of Beymit Maylin, Sakin Sifulin, Marjan Jumabayev, Ahmed Baytursunov were taken away and exiled. She said that it was thanks to the fact that she got married. To avoid prison and disgrace, Amina Mametova remarried. She lived with her second husband for nearly 25 years. But Manshuk, perhaps due to her age, did not understand and did not accept her mother's decision. She refused to return to the house where Amina now lived with another man. The girl enrolled into university preparatory program and moved to a student dormitory. Her heart filled with bitterness and resentment. She hated the injustice. She couldn't understand how it was possible. People she considered family, friends and colleagues just yesterday. Today, seeing her in the street, crossed to the other side, turned away and pretended that they didn't notice her. And these terrible words, the daughter of the enemy of the people, rang in her ears and weighed heavily on her. Manchok, who was used to being around people and attending events, suddenly felt lonely. She was left alone. Almost. There was only one friend who stayed by her side during this difficult time. He was not afraid of condemnation. He helped in every way he could. He helped moving into the dorm, provided moral support, had long conversations with her, and sometimes made jokes. This man was none other than the future famous writer Ilyas Yisrinberlin. Manshuk dreamed of becoming a doctor, following her father's footsteps, but she had to somehow make a living, earn money. So she gets a job as a secretary typist at the People's Commissariat of Health, where she established herself as a responsible and amiable worker. She dealt with the distribution of humanitarian aid and other important issues. But a year later, Manshuk finally fulfills her dream and enrolls in a medical university. Вопрос о создании в республике Медвуза был поставлен еще в 1928 году, а в 1931 он уже... The country wanted to establish a medical university since 1928, and in 1931 it opened its doors to students. Sanjaras Finziarov was appointed its first rector. He was an outstanding statesman, a member of the Alash party and a doctor, who until that moment had headed the Moscow Institute of Oriental Studies. However, he was persecuted around the same time as Manchuk's father and other like-minded people. All of this still did not discourage Manchuk from serving the country and the people. She wanted to treat people, she dreamed of doing science and, like her father, fighting epidemics. She also dreamed of going to Moscow and taking a walk along the Red Square. But these dreams would never come true. The war has begun. She has always been a great shooter. 
As a student, she used to go to a shooting range of the society for the assistance of defense, aircraft and chemical construction. Although, she planned to showcase her skills at competitions and not in battle. She was preparing for the all-union parade of athletes. But life has a way of taking over. She could not stand aside when her country was at war with the enemy. So she wrote a letter asking to be conscripted and sent to the front line. I, Vanshuk Mametova, attach my brief autobiography and ask you to send me to the front line, along with my brothers and sisters, to destroy the Nazis, these bandits. I have no brother or sister to send to war, so I ask to go myself. I ask you to satisfy the request. Komsomol member since 1938, Mavetova, 27th August 1941. Her request was denied, but she didn't want to give up. She wrote three more such letters. Her desire to get to the front reflected deep patriotism, love for the homeland, the hope of saving her father, and the despair of a person who was left alone and has nothing to lose. In the end, she went to the front as part of the 100th Rifle Division, which everyone called Kazakh. The 100th Kazakh Rifle Division consisted of 80% Kazakh and only 20% Russians, Ukrainians, Tatars and representatives of other nationalities. In total, 1,200,000 Kazakh people went to the front. For a country that survived collectivization, famine and repressions, a country in a deep demographic crisis, more than a million people is a huge figure. But there was no other way. The enemy was advancing, while bombing the cities and burning villages, and driving away thousands of innocent people into captivity. Interestingly, on November the 7th, 1941, soldiers would depart for the front from the Red Square because the enemy was already near Moscow. Before people went into battle, Stalin gave an example of Alexander Nevsky, Bogdan Khmelnytsky, Alexander Suvorov, Mikhail Kutuzov, and said, let their spirit guide you. This was a sort of signal to other nations as well. Soldiers gathering at Almaty train station to live for the front would remember the name of Kenyasari Khan. Doctor of Philology Professor Malik Gabdulin recalled that during his fight when they were surrounded near Moscow. He was remembering the time of Kenyasari Khan and Nauras Bay Batar. Even though members of Kazakh intelligentsia left for the war, they still managed to publish a lot of frontline newspapers. Russian writers enthusiastically wrote about our soldiers. I think that this war has shown who is who. The fact that there are more than 100 Kazakhs who have received the title of the hero of the Soviet Union says a lot. Especially after all these repressions, all these humiliations. Kazakhs fought valiantly. They showed their heroism on the battlefields. And of course, this war will remain in the collective memory. We honor those years. This war affected every Kazakh citizen, every family. And yet, we are still learning about the Second World War. Not all mysteries have been uncovered. A lot of the archives are still classified. Some materials are only now seeing the light. Каждого казаха, каждого казахстанца, каждой семьи, я хочу сказать. И поэтому э, сейчас мы только сейчас узнаем, э, даже Вторая мировая война, я вам хочу сказать, еще до конца не открыта. Сейчас наши еще архивы столько засекреченных, только-только сейчас открываются эти материалы. Manchuk's battalion consisted of 4,890 people, but there were only two women, Mariam Sarlabaeva and Manchuk Mametova. 
Manchuk first was appointed as a clerk in the HQ, but she did not want to be a clerk. She wanted to fight. This is where the skills she learned from her father and the knowledge gained at the medical university came in handy. Nurses were in short supply at the front, so Manchuk showed her medical skills. She could not only bandage wounds and apply tourniquets, but also remove bullets and stop the bleeding. During one battle, Manchuk saw a machine gunner being killed. When the Nazis realized that the path was clear, their infantry started attacking. But Manchuk did not panic. She reached the machine gun and deflected the enemy attack. After that, she began asking her commanding officer, Kalisar Kabdulinov, to transfer her to a machine gun battalion. At first, she came to the headquarters as a medical instructor. However, after a while, she began asking for a transfer. She approached my father several times, saying that she wanted to learn how to operate a machine gun. Of course, I tried to dissuade her many times, because this is not a woman's job. I told her that she needed to live, that she had her whole future ahead of her. She was already in enough danger, her life was already under risk. But she apparently set herself this goal to fight, to learn operating the machine gun, do a man's job. She had a very stubborn and single-minded personality. You could feel it. And of course, she achieved her goal. She learned how to operate the machine gun. She joined the troops in the battlefield on par with male soldiers. Manchuk's fate was decided. She realized that the machine gun would become her weapon. Of course, lifting a 60-kilogram Maxi machine gun was no easy feat when you yourself weigh 45 kilograms. But she learned how to skillfully assemble it. She trained all her free time from battles and, as a result, was named an excellent machine gunner. In between fights, Manchuk wrote letters to her adoptive mother. She wrote that she missed her, that she no longer feels the resentment, that she yearns for home, that she dreams of seeing her beloved blooming Almaty wrapped in the aroma of apples, that she believes in victory, but waking up every morning she does not know if it is her last one. My heart loves you even more. I want you to write more often. When I receive a letter from you, I feel better. And my fate is unclear. It's hard to say if I will survive. If I die, it will be for the motherland, for my father, for you. She always loved her father and was proud of him. She was proud of who her parents were. Even if such a tragedy happened to her father, she went to the front, keeping the spirit. She wanted to exonerate her father. She wanted to dedicate her fights with the enemy, to dedicate her war to the blessed memory of her father. She knew that he was an innocent man and a man devoted to his homeland. This was her motivation, her driver. This was motivating her even on the battlefield. People described her rushing headlong into battle. I think that she showed acts of bravery and became a hero. Deservedly so. Why? Because she knew that she was defending her homeland, her father's memory, her mother. The wind of first love suddenly burst into her life and filled with meaning her war-consumed days. It warmed her heart and gave her hope, a hope for a simple type of happiness, which she was not meant to know. 
The commander of her machine gun battalion, Nurken Husainov, was a tall and fit man. He was strict with everyone but Manshuk, and people noticed this, as well as the glances the young lovers exchanged. People tried to give them some alone time. Such moments together made them feel like the world is standing still, like the time had stopped, like there was no war and no losses. They both love Kazakh poetry, especially the works of Abai. And these conversations took them far, far away, where the smell of steppe wormwood excites the soul and the wind whooshes in the hair. They did not promise anything to each other or confess their love, knowing full well that each of their meetings may be the last. She was very intrusive, resolute, steadfast and brave. She had a strong personality, but she still experienced this girlish love, falling for Nurken. He used to look at her with a loving look, and it was noticeable. Alexander Prokopenko used to tell this. He said it was impossible not to see. They used to sit opposite each other. He would read some lines, and then she would. They exchanged glances when they parted. He quietly approached her and kissed her on the cheek. She blushed, sprung up, and quickly ran away. She did not even expect that this would be their last kiss. When the morning would come, her last battle would start. They met for the first time before the battle to defend the city of Nevel. This small town was an important post of the offensive operation, which was called Nevel Operation. After the Battle of Kursk, the Red Army launched a general offensive on the southern and central sectors of the Soviet-German front. In order to prevent the German troops from moving into the southwest, the Soviet army had to quickly break through the German defenses, swiftly capture Nevil and occupy advantageous positions for further fights. Surprise and swift action were of decisive importance. Any delay could lead to the disruption of the operation, since in this case, the German command would have the time to remove reserves and strengthen the defense. The attack began on the morning of October 15th. The Nazi fought back. The enemy mainly attacked the positions of the 21st Guards Rifle Division and the 100th Rifle Division, which was Manshuk's division. The Germans did not want to give up this hub. For them this was a turning point, so over and over again they rushed ahead. Three machine gun crews, including Manchuk's crew, entrenched themselves on the high point, disrupting the enemy's attack in their area. Manchuk's rifle division had the task of capturing the highest point. This would affect the outcome of the battle. It was a cold October. She did not know how this fight would end for her. And probably hardly any of these guys thought at that moment about what would happen tomorrow. For them, there was only this moment, this battle, the single goal of destroying the enemy. They needed to defeat them and complete the task at any cost. And they managed to do this. The German command lost a major transport hub in Nevel. The entire communication systems of the Wehrmacht was disrupted, and this led to a series of further defeats. Hitler repeatedly demanded to recapture this hub, to eliminate this gap in the German defense. However, as the German infantry general wrote in his notes, this gap turned into a bleeding wound at the junction of both armies. But the operation would be completed a lot later. For now, Manshuk and her fellow soldiers were fighting the enemy, so fearlessly and successfully that the Germans had only one thing left to do, shell the area with mortar fire. She saw how her beloved died. Nurken Hussainov was killed in the same battle, but Manshuk did not leave the battlefield. She only gripped the handle of her machine gun even tighter and fired at the enemy, clenching her teeth. For the motherland, for Almaty, for her father, for Nurken, for every friend she lost in this war. One by one, machine guns stopped firing. 
Looking around, she saw that every minute, every second, more of her fellow soldiers died. We lost a lot of people. Leaving our positions, we were forced to retreat. On our way, we saw Manshuk fighting all alone, with a wound to her head, but still managing to deftly rearrange the machine guns of the dead. We asked her to come with us. She replied, you go. If I live, who will cover you? And she continued shooting. We left. After a while, everything calmed down. We looked at each other and realized it's all over. I want to say that if Manchuk had not covered us, the retreating soldiers, we would not have survived. We owe our lives to Manchuk. She was left alone at the post, but she did not lay down her arms. A nearby mine hit her in the head. Manchuk lost her consciousness. But suddenly, a piercing noise brought her back to reality. She had difficulty opening her blood-stained eyes, but she saw the Nazis advancing. She sprang up and resumed firing, until the very end. Until the last drop of blood. In that battle, she killed more than 70 fascist soldiers. In this battle of Nevel, she did not give up. She fought with her machine gun, platoon. She never stopped firing. She did not seek mercy for the enemy. She fought with dignity and died with dignity, like a hero. You cannot say that Manshuk was a fragile girl. She was a batir, a warrior. She's still lying in the land she protected. She was buried in Nevel. Little Bid Manshuk, a girl with beautiful eyes, was only eight days short of her 21st birthday. She was not meant to see the victory day, return home, walk around the beloved city, breathing the smell of blooming apple trees. She would never know the happiness of motherhood. She died a heroic death, but forever remained in the history as the first Kazakh female hero of the Soviet Union. And even if the Union no longer exists, she is still our heroine, the great and legendary daughter of the Kazakh steppe. You gave your life to something you believed was true, and your descendants will forever honor your feet and memory of you. We'll not forget the time of trials, not all its traces yet have been erased. Your fate, brave Kazakh woman, by every step man will forever be embraced. They would imagine, in a country now at peace, the image of the walk you took among your aging girlfriends, our heroine, forever young Manshuk, along the streets where you would walk with your friends.